um, always come together for me. Uh, oops, there we go. Um, how that should not only relate to our research, but should feed into almost everything we do in academia. And I think in the actual abstract, I talked about the nooks and crannies of academia. So hopefully what I say today will make sense um, across a few of those angles. Um, so while many of you maybe know me as a HCI researcher, um, you might be surprised to see very little technology uh, in, in that first slide and also maybe what I'll talk about today. So that's partly because a lot of the work that I do is quite theoretical and hard to visualize, um, but also because a lot of the projects I'm currently working on are much less of this visual or, or digital way of thinking and more about how do we think about academia and how does address this orientation help us understand HCI as a discipline or, or as, a, as a space of working. Um, but I also want to share with you a little bit about my background, um, because the rest of my talk will make much more sense if I do that. Um, so I only came to HCI during my PhD and previously studied and researched in the social sciences and education specifically. So first I trained as a primary school teacher, focusing on reform pedagogies and creative approaches to English as second language learning. Uh, and of course, critical pedagogy within that. And then um, I moved into international development and education, learning more about wider politics of education in globalized systems and developing understanding around cultural hegemony and post-colonialism and infrastructuring impacts on development and gender equity and all of those things. Um, and during my final project, I started to work with HCI researchers um, to study informal learning networks, especially among adults experiencing homelessness in Bucharest and Romania. So one of the take takeaways from that project was more of a social science interpretation of their use of technologies and development of implications for design that were rooted in harm reduction, politics and social histories in Romania, as well as political engagement in HCI as a space. So after that, I started my PhD program in digital civics, focusing on the design, development, and adaptation of digital technologies, specifically in sex work support services, where I developed a conceptual framework called justice-oriented ecologies to better understand how academia and third sector services can work together to develop shared understandings of justice and to work towards developing and working towards worlds through collaborative design inquiries where that justice is understood and realized in some ways. So as I was writing up, I also, as I said before, moved to Swansea University, um, where I actually worked in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice um, before moving to Northumbria, where I am now, to take up my lectureship in the design school. So I have a really messy background is what I'm trying to say. Um, but I'm, I'm now in the design school, also a founding member um, and co-director of the Design Feminisms Research Group, where we're trying to expand our horizons in design beyond interaction design and HCI, as well as digital technologies and moving towards kind of metaphors of craft and textiles and, and ways of understanding the world through critical design practices. Um, so, at the moment, I'm working on a number of different strands of research that relate to feminist security studies and harm reduction, as well as women's support services and the roles that craft and technologies can play to support post-traumatic recovery, um, such as electronic textiles, and also thinking about critical pedagogy as a, as a way of approaching learning and unlearning in the higher education sector. So that relates to my teaching practice, but also how I think about my own learning in academia as well. Um, and the kind of last strand of my work is related to uh, injustices of academia as a whole. So I, I'm working on some projects around plagiarism of early career researchers by senior academics and the precarity um, of staff often employed in justice oriented tech research. Um, so it's like a it's a bit messy, um, but I think it's quite important to know that messy background to understand why my research kind of sits somewhere at the intersection of HCI and criminology, critical pedagogy, science and technology studies, craft, and wider social sciences as well. So just like my recent work on, on quilting and embroidery and sewing, which Anisha already mentioned the book is about, um, I see that as part of my own critical making and research practice to understand the layers involved in research, my disciplinary and experiential background, um, you know, are, an, are almost like an ever-growing patchwork of collaboration and participatory action of reading, learning, unlearning, 
developing practice and co-creation. So the reason I'm telling you all of this is because it makes kind of also almost makes clear my lack of regard for academic boundaries sometimes. Um, so while I've studied in detail the ways in which academic and third sector organizations and worlds can come together during my PhD and how together we can develop justice oriented, justice -oriented ecologies, I now look towards the work that is important for what I am trying to study, not focusing on where that work comes from. This allows me to kind of work through some of the porous disciplinary boundaries that we have and that I know you have in your group as well from the conversation we just had before, um, while also keeping in mind and keeping the importance um, and honoring the, the heritages of these separate disciplines um, to, under, to contextually understand where researchers I'm reading about and reading from come from. So thinking of my journey as one that is not only about the presence or lack thereof of disciplines, but also the epistemologies that I learned about in all of these different spaces, the many invisible or hidden things that we do um, that have allowed me to read more widely and deeply at the same time. It's allowed me to interpret the same ideas through different lenses and through all of the different projects and work I've done, I learned that my personal politics about equity and social justice and experiences of volunteering, my activism, and my own experiences of violence and oppression were seeping into my research. So on top of all of that, I care about the people with whom I work and the work I do de has deeply personal impact on my life. Or in some instances, the research becomes almost like a mirror to my own life. So the traditional research training I had in the social sciences and in HCI taught me that this would mean that I was being biased in my research. The more critical and participatory approaches I had learned about would have allowed me to acknowledge these as part of my research process, but that still felt like I wasn't really, it wasn't really enough to acknowledge them, to just acknowledge them. So the research as experienced, what it reminded me of and what it made me think about was shaping what I was thinking, doing, how I felt. So I could no longer separate my personal life and my research completely. Experiences with participants and research partners made me care and feel things. And while at first I tried to keep my life and research separate with this looming fear of subjectivity that's been instilled in me through my research training, deep down I knew that that was just not sustainable anymore. So my feminist and justice oriented agenda to everyday study and work life has bled into my research. And at this point has deeply intertwined the two. So realizing this and embracing it has allowed me to better understand the work I do, how I do it and why I do it. And to frame it as, a, as trying to do work on in the world projects where I work collaborative, collaboratively with third sector organizations, communities and activists to imagine and build better worlds now. So to do this, I, I required deep understanding of the kinds of impact I wanted to have. And this is where justice theory came in for me, and particularly Nancy Fraser's understanding of multidimensional and abnormal justice. And I won't go into detail of that here today, but it's important just to say that counter to traditional design models of doing justice or designing just systems, using histories of feminist thought and Nancy Fraser's Marxist feminist approach to understanding justice, um, as well as kind of my recent readings on, on Michelle Fine's Just Research in Contentious Times, which by the way is a fa fabulous book from a kind of critical criminological reading um, and, and, and my own learning of decoloniality as well, allows me to see justice as an orientation rather than a thing that exists. Justice is malleable. It is not a structure. It's not a system of law or policy. Justice and injustice, as well as abnormal justice or multidimensional justice are experienced and lived. They change based on access to formal processes, both, but also based on the color of our skin, our religion, our work practices and coping mechanisms for experiences of trauma, among of course, many, many other things. Seeing justice as an orientation to our work as designers, technologists or researchers, allows us to use it as a lens to explore what we are working on rather than seeing it as an ultimate end goal or specific policy or process that will bring justice to all people. Instead, it allows us to ask questions with the communities who live in worlds of injustice. It allows us to question structures, subvert them, alter them, or to build alternatives. 
It allows us to bring conversations of technologies away from the technicalities and architectures, and instead allows us to see them as part of wider ecologies of services and care. To see and understand the role and responsibility of technology design and development from a perspective, from a different perspective, while simultaneously not looking for solutions. It forces us to unpick our own understandings and how we and our work uphold systems of oppression, not only necessarily to design out this oppression, um, but to understand it and ultimately work towards dismantling this oppressive system and building up alternatives. So most recently, I was reading this book, um, A Decolonial F Feminism, um, which is a, a thread of thinking that started about two years ago um, by my learning with Deborah de Castro Leal, Ana Bustamante, and Max Kruger, and the collaborative writing and learning collective we're developing. So this quote, I won't read all of it, um, but this quote is something I'm currently aspiring to. And it was something I wanted to share with you as well. And importantly, the first line of it is that a feminist cannot claim to possess the theory and the method. She seeks to be multidimensional and intersecting, which is, I think, really important, especially when we think about design and technologies. We have to be intersectional. We have to be multidimensional and explore different people's perceptions and experiences. But this quote and the text itself is situated in has allowed me to attempt to see things differently and the book as a whole has offered me ways of sitting with the discomfort of my own heritage and history of how I have contributed myself to injustices and harm. But it has also given me tangible ways forward of how to unpick my actions through theory and to theorize my practice through thinking, writing and talking, but also through my own critical making practice related to embroidery, sewing and quilting. And for me, critical pedagogy is one way of unpicking and re-sewing these kinds of connections on individual, collective and systematic scales. So I already mentioned the importance of learning and unlearning, and that's where I go to my pedagogy and teaching roots. Critical pedagogy teaches us about the importance of politics and learning, about our understanding oppressions, hierarchical, systemic and internal, and developing praxis to counter these. This should be part of our teaching, of course, but I also see this as part of my research practice, my way of engaging with people, research, collaborators, of engaging my own perceptions and learning, of dismantling oppressive academic structures and hegemonic Western ideas of knowledge, design, technologies. It allows me to look beyond immediate supply chains and instead think about the impact our research has beyond their intentions. Of course, as academics, it is our job to keep learning. And these books have been beyond influential for me. They've given me understanding and power. They've given me permission to be a dissident voice, to integrate transgression and dissidence into my pedagogy with students across all levels from foundation to PhD. But they've also, of course, allowed me to unpick power and oppression as part of that and as part of the academic system. And one quote I keep coming back to is Maria Puig de la Bella Casa's ways of studying and representing things can have world making effects. So all of this that I'm talking about critical pedagogy and justice orientations and decolonial thinking to me is because how we talk about things and how we represent them in our designs in our technologies in and of itself have world making effects and impact on how people are perceived talked about who they are and who they could or should be. So taking this quote and her words as a starting point in how I think about my research and teaching and academic practice, I often think about not whether my research will have impact in the world, but rather what kind of impact it will have and I would like it to have. So how can I configure, contextualize and conceptualize my work in a way that it will not only not do harm, but instead actually work towards having positive effects and how does this relate to academia or, be, or research, but also academia more widely? So while this is all very admirable and great to think through theoretically, the practice can be very messy and complicated and often is filled with anxiety, at least for myself. So it means I have to look beyond the research practice, methods and outcomes, and instead think about what it means to do the work we do how it relates to our teaching, our administrative processes, our funding structures and histories of UK hegemony in the world. To me, thinking about sewing helps illustrate this. 
So just like in our research, we present beautifully crafted pieces, in this case, an embroidery hoop I'm currently working on. In academia, this is perhaps the paper or report that we publish once a project is finished. The finished teaching slides and activities we produce or our polished Athena Swan reports of how we are changing to create an equitable university, even if our thinking about those topics is not complete. But when we look behind this facade of completion, just like we can look beyond this embroidery hoop, we see that things are much more messy and we can learn, we can and should do this with our data and our practice too. So our work as academics is rarely tidy, especially when working in participatory, collaborative or in the world ways. At least for me, separating out my research from my teaching doesn't really work anymore. And my research has become intertwined with the work and research of my collaborators, both in and outside academia, as well as the PhD students and MA students with whom I work. This is not linear or clear cut in any way. And arguments change while doing the work. Perceptions, understandings of justice and injustice, of harm and oppression, our behaviors change. And there's so much work that is done that is so rarely addressed, talked about, or workloaded. And I think it is important for us to sit with this every now and again, to look behind the patchwork of our identities and figure out which elements are still important, which create an imbalance in the, fin in, in the finished pattern, what fabrics and materials do we want to use to create our lived reality, and which patches are become threadbare and obsolete, what kinds of threads did we use to stitch together these individual pieces, and which of these are starting to fall apart. So one way of doing this for me is through developing the worlds we want to see in the now, to prefigure them. So Mariam Assad writes wonderfully about how such a prefigurative politic, this, this notion that the world we want to see, the, the justice we want to experience is enacted by how we operate now. Um, so she writes about this and how it can become a way of engaging in research justice through research sharing, enacting genuine and material solidarity. Um, and I would add to this the element of care in a really thick sense of material support and calling out our friends if they're doing something harmful is also integral to developing this prefigurative world that we want to see. And that's also integral to our design and technology practice. And that practice can be a way of making material and making tangible our interconnected ways of being and to extend our theoretical ethos of justice orientation into application and practice. So how can we actually do this and what are some tangible ways of doing it? So I'm gonna briefly present three ideas that I've, that I've had that we can try to do this um, and how they apply to academia more widely. Um, but it's hard and it requires us to be open to uncovering our own oppressive behaviors, to untangle our own identities and how they benefit from, benefit from the existing unjust system. But it also gives us permission to step into the power that we have, that we may or may not be aware of yet. So I said I had three concepts um, and I wanna share them with you and they're not something I've necessarily talked about very much, but I'd be really interested to hear what you think. So um, the first is selfish reading. So this is something I feel like I've been doing for a long time, but didn't have a word for it. So of course, my ability to read deeply and reflexively changes drastically based on what day it is, or what week it is, and how much other things I'm doing. Um, there are weeks where I cannot read anything usefully or where I hit a bit of a wall and, and nothing makes sense anymore. But there are also weeks where, where I get excited by a paper or a book that is only very tangentially related to my research. But that's often when I end up reading these things out of selfish interest or pleasure, that I learn more about my research project and practice than when I read specifically for a reason. So I want to encourage us all to read more selfishly um, and to ask ourselves what happens when you read things you actually care about rather than things you think you need to read. And what happens when you reflect on how they relate to your own work and the work of others while reading these things. The, the second kind of term I'm creating is this idea of a careful curiosity. So of course, curiosity is very important when working in research. 
Um, and I distinctly remember saying when I applied for my PhD that I was a curious person. But curiosity can also turn into voyeurism, tokenism and community fetishism, especially when we work with communities that are in some way made marginal in society. And this can happen when we work in justice oriented ways as well. So when we study people and their interactions with technologies and data. So again, I have two questions um, that relate to this kind of careful curiosity that tries to avoid this voyeurism and just being genuinely curious about people's experience and lives and the injustices they face or the ways they're working towards justice. So what happens when we slow down in our research and carefully move towards alternative ways of knowing? And what happens to our research when we do it more carefully, treading slowly to try to genuinely and deeply understand what is happening and why this is the case? And finally, this idea of a praxis of hope. And I actually write about this a bit in my book. Um, so I work with people who are marginalized in settings that often feel hopeless when working in a political environment as we have today, where cuts to social spending seem to constantly be made directly and negatively impacting the people with whom I work. But working with partners who do proactive work and also working to make academia a better place for people, especially early career researchers, makes me think about praxis of hope. And what happens when we think of our research as playing a part in a wider practical application of the hope that we have towards better futures? And how would this way of thinking influence our methodologies to include elements of building, co-maintaining and co-infrastructuring hopeful actions? And what do all of these look like across not just our research work, but across our whole area of academia? So these are, these are two questions that maybe we can discuss at the end, but how can, engage, how can engaging in selfish reading, developing a careful curiosity and applying praxis of hope be integrated into research, pedagogy, relationships and wider academic structures? And how can we use these concepts to topple inherently unjust systems and instead center multidimensional, polyvocal and collective ways of being, knowing and working? And I would argue that by thinking with those two questions, we can work towards a justice oriented academic practice that paves a path for working towards justice with design in the now. Or as co-authors and I wrote in a paper in 2019, that we can then use design processes with affected communities as a way of pinpointing routes towards, towards and enacting genuine political change to tackle the injustices at their roots rather than designing technologies in an attempt to rectify some of the symptoms of abnormal justice or, or injustice. But this is something that you know, we have to ask ourselves, is that something that we actually want to do in a system as broken as academia? Knowing about the many injustices in our academic structures around racism, sexism, ableism, precarity, harassment, bullying, and other abuses of power, forces us to ask a hard question of ourselves and the structures in which we operate. Should we work to improve academia for ourselves and others, or is it a lost cause? And that is one that we have to ask ourselves individually, and we have to acknowledge that our answers will change as time progresses. At the moment, my answer is that I have worked to see and find the praxis of hope that exist in academia, the pockets of genuineness and of mutual support. That for me, the answer is, that it is a structure worth saving, something we have to dismantle and build up in an entirely different way, but something that I see as necessary and important. This is then, of course, leads us to the question of where do we start? And this hoop was made in response to another talk I gave last summer um, when, I, when I talked about the ongoing struggles around racism and sexism in the ACM Sikai community. And we had, a, we had, a, had a panel where others talked alongside me, of course, as well. And it was well-intentioned, but it irked me a little bit. And the answer to this is the work is already going on. When you start to work on embedded and on embedding a prefigurative politic of embedding justice orientations in academia, you will discover that this work is already happening at your university. It may not be public. It, may, it will not be supported by the system, even if sometimes it seems to be on the surface, but it exists. And we require networks of networks, whisper communities, and ongoing solidarity across diverse struggles 
to build connections and sew together the patchwork of genuine solidarity to replace the old tattered male pale and stale brotherhood of academic seniority. Um, and that is something that we have to do, not just in our research practice. That's something that comes when we work in a just when we work through a lens of justice or an orientation of justice, rather than working to do design justice or creating a justice. It's something that we have to do together across everything we do in academia, in our teaching, our research, our administrative processes, how we talk about the people with whom we work, how we write about them in our papers and funding applications. It is small, small steps and small mundane actions that we can do on a daily basis with ourselves and with others that will help us get to a more just academia and, and research practice in HCI. And that's where I'm going to leave it today. <laughs> um, thank you very much for listening to me. I, I hope it made sense. Um, and um, if you're interested in, in this kind of thinking, I, I do write about praxis of hope and a few of the textile metaphors that I talked about today as well on, on the patchworks and looking behind the scenes and looking behind the, the threads of our research and, and academia in the book that, that was mentioned. And it is called Digitally Augmenting Traditional Craft Practices for Social Justice. And there's a there's a, a discount code there as well, if, which I can send to you afterwards as well. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Angelica. That was uh, that was a really, really fascinating talk. I'm trying to stop.